Hello everyone and welcome to the Barnes & Noble Education Fiscal 2022 Second Quarter Earnings Conference Call. My name is Bethany and I'll be your co-operator today. I would now like to hand the call over to your host, Andy Millavoy, Vice President of Investor Relations. Andy, please go ahead. Good morning and welcome to our Fiscal 2022 Second Quarter Earnings Call. Joining us today are Mike Hughesby, CEO and Chairman, Tom Donahue, CFO, Jonathan Shar, Executive Vice President, BNED Retail, David Henderson, President of MBS, and David Nenke, President of DSS. Before we begin the call, I'd like to remind you that the statements we make on today's call are covered by the Safe Harbor Disclaimer contained in our press release and public documents. The contents of this call are the property of Barnes & Noble Education and are not for rebroadcast or use by any other party without prior written consent of Barnes & Noble Education. During this call, we will make forward-looking statements with predictions, projections, and other statements about future events. These statements are based upon current expectations and assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties, including those contained in our press release and public filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The company disclaims any obligation to update any forward-looking statements that may be made or discussed during this call. And now, I'll turn the call over to Mike Husby. Thanks, Andy, and thank you all for joining us this morning. We were thrilled to welcome students back to campus this fall. Our second quarter results reflected their eagerness to return to an on-campus, in-person learning environment with a significantly increased resumption of on-campus events and sporting activities. This was further corroborated by an NRF report issued this summer that indicated that college students and their families had planned to spend an average of $1,200 on college or university items, 13% more than a year ago as students prepared to transition back to an in-person learning experience. The top three categories included electronics, dorm furnishings, and clothing. While many institutions implemented policies to return students to an on-campus learning experience, the volume of students, alumni, and tourists is not yet back to pre-pandemic levels. The operating environment continues to present a number of different challenges, including undergraduate enrollment declines of approximately 3%, according to the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, fewer international students than pre-COVID levels, and many community colleges continuing to offer virtual classes. In addition to enrollment declines, we are also experiencing challenges with escalating freight costs, labor shortages, and supply chain issues. While we expect these conditions to persist through fiscal 22, we're hopeful that they will begin to mitigate as we move into the next fiscal year. Despite these challenges, our organization has proved resilient in providing best-in-class service to our campus partners and their students. The growth of our first day offerings helped to mitigate the macro pressures on our course materials business and through our general merchandise partnership with Fanatics and Lids, we were better positioned to address the global supply chain issues facing many retailers. As we look ahead, our entire organization is excited by our company's momentum as we continue to execute on strategic initiatives that further distinguish our competitive offerings, which as a whole cannot be replicated in the marketplace. Our innovative academic solutions offerings, unparalleled merchandise assortment, new best-in-class omni-channel customer experience, and strategic investments provide an unparalleled customer value proposition for the institutions and the customers that we serve all of which we expect to accelerate our growth. The benefits of our inclusive access course material models are resonating with institutions across the country and delivering greater student access and better student outcomes. We are seeing tremendous demand for our first day complete equitable access program as schools have demonstrated the positive impact the solution has on improving student outcomes and reducing stress at the beginning of each academic term. Additionally, first day complete eliminates barriers to course material access, allowing students to engage with the course content from day one 
and achieve greater academic success. Equally important, the program also supports our school partners' missions of improving student academic achievement, persistence, and retention. It's not surprising that based on these benefits, we experienced significant growth in the 2021 fall term when first day complete was offered through 65 campus bookstores up from just 12 campus bookstores the prior year, representing approximately 295,000 total undergraduate student enrollment up from 43,000 students last fall, an almost seven times year over year increase. With this growth, the program was available across a broad spectrum of schools from small private colleges to large public universities and multi-campus community college systems. Year over year, revenue for both our first day models increased 80%. For the 2022 spring term, we have 10 additional stores that have signed up for first day complete, representing undergraduate enrollment of over 86,000 students. First day complete is disrupting the traditional course material delivery model in collaboration with leading institutions across the country. By delivering all course materials via one convenient service, First Day Complete ensures that students have access to all their learning materials across all of their courses before the first day of class. This allows them to engage with course content from day one to support their academic success. Also, First Day Complete offers full academic freedom for faculty allowing them to select the best course materials for the term from BNED's expansive relationship with more than 6,000 publishers, creating a one-stop, simplified experience. Data shows that course materials are still an optional purchase for many students, even though it's been well-documented that students who have their course materials before the start of class perform better academically. First Day Complete helps to remove barriers and provides the same fundamental level of access across an entire institution for all students. Our survey showed that students who utilized the program felt that they had better experiences, were better prepared for the academic term, and ultimately achieved better academic results, confirming BNC's Equitable Access Program is making a positive impact on student success. First Day Complete is also proving to be a competitive advantage for the schools that have adopted it, which we believe will further help to accelerate the adoption by additional schools. Some BNC partner institutions have started to report that they have seen enrollment growth, which they, at least in part, attribute to the ability to market the benefits of First Day Complete to prospective students. Turning now to our general merchandise business, with the resumption of on-campus events and sporting activities, we experienced 78% gross comparable sales growth during the second quarter. Our partnership with Fanatics and Lids offers an unparalleled merchandise assortment and a best-in-class omni-channel customer experience for logo and emblematic products, allowing us to offer our schools a totally reimagined retail experience. This partnership expands the breadth and quality of our offerings in-store and online, including newer, more exciting brands such as Vineyard Vines, Lululemon, and Johnny O, that are highly relevant for our student, parent, and alumni demographic. Both partners are leaders in their space, which provides us with buying power and a partnership that schools will benefit from. We have already seen the impact on winning new business and are excited to see what this year will bring as the strategic partnership will ultimately benefit the students and schools that we serve. Specific to Fanatics, we will benefit from their powerful e-commerce systems and data insights to grow market share and add new customers. These sites are truly best in class, mobile first experiences that leverage the Fanatic platform to provide an incredible user experience. We continued to transition additional school e-commerce websites to the new Fanatic experience and through November, we now have over 540 sites live on the Fanatic platform. Turning to our DSS business, our Bartleby suite of solutions continues to exhibit its rapid growth. DSS revenue grew 39% to $8.3 million, with Bartleby revenue growing approximately 70% year over year. 
probably generated 120,000 new growth subscribers during the quarter, representing a 33% year-over-year growth. We introduced Bartleby Plus during the quarter, which combined Bartleby Learn with Bartleby Write to provide a dynamic study bundle to help students tackle their assignments 24-7. This comprehensive offering includes over 5 million step-by-step -step textbook and homework solutions, a math solver with detailed solutions, expert Q&A in 30 subjects, essay templates that help students outline their papers with an interactive guide, plagiarism detection, and a citations generator, amongst other tools. Bartleby's products and services are designed to improve student success and outcomes, offering pathways for learning that fit the schedules and demands of today's student. We believe our bundle provides tremendous value to help improve student outcomes. In conclusion, while there continue to be various challenges operating our business in this COVID-affected environment, we remain focused on executing our strategic growth initiatives, which is already helping to mitigate the impact of such near-term challenges. Most importantly, we believe these initiatives position us well for longer-term sustainable growth. With that, I will turn it over to Tom for the financial review. Thanks, Mike. Please note that the second quarter of fiscal 2022, consisting of 13 weeks, ended on October 30th, 2021. All comparisons will be to the second quarter of fiscal 2021, unless otherwise noted. As Mike highlighted earlier, while we are not back to pre-pandemic levels, the second quarter, which is historically the highest sales period for the company, benefited from many students returning to in-person classes and greater attendance at campus events and sporting activities as compared to the year-ago period when schools supplemented in-person classes with hybrid and remote learning models coupled with a significant reduction in events and sporting activities. Total sales for the quarter were $627 million compared to $595.5 million in the prior year. This increase of $31.5 million, or 5.3%, was comprised of a $32.4 million increase from the retail segment, a $14.7 million decrease from the wholesale segment, and a $2.3 million increase from the DSS segment. Retail gross comparable store sales increased 13.2% during the quarter. Gross comparable textbook sales were essentially flat as the broader industry headwinds were mitigated by the rapid growth of our first day offerings. BNC's first day complete and first day by course offerings increased revenue by 80% to $96 million during the quarter as compared to $53.4 million in the prior year period. Gross comparable general merchandise sales increased 78.3% as compared to a 52% decline a year ago. Our general merchandise business benefited from the return of many students to the campus and the reopening of most of our campus stores, the majority of which were closed in the year ago period due to COVID. As a reminder, per our agreement with Fanatics and Lids, logo and emblematic product sales are now accounted for under the agency accounting method in which BNED receives a percent of sales for the logo and emblematic sales online and in-store. Each sales channel, in-store and online, has its own commission rate, which will change as the relationship matures. Our comparable sales reflect the actual retail selling price or tender received for the products sold under the agency model rather than solely the commission received, whereas gap sales on our P&L reflect the commission we've received. Net sales for the wholesale segment decreased 14.7 million, or 40.5%, to 21.7 million, primarily due to COVID-19 related supply constraints, resulting from the lack of on-campus textbook buyback opportunities during the prior fiscal year and lower customer demand which was partially offset by lower returns and allowances. Additionally, during the prior year period, Wholesale's CSS model fulfilled direct-to-student course material orders for retail's campus bookstores that were not fully operational due to COVID-19 campus store closures, whereas those sales shifted back to the campus bookstores in the current period. DSS sales grew 2.3 million, or 39.2%, to 8.3 million, benefiting from an increase in subscription sales. 
The consolidated gross margin rate for the quarter was 23.2% compared to 19.4% in the prior year period. This was primarily due to the favorable sales mix of higher margin general merchandise products, lower contract costs on renewals and new contracts, coupled with lower inventory reserves and lower markdowns. Our selling and administrative expenses increased by 15.9 million, or 17.3%, compared with the prior year period as we reopened most stores and brought employees back to serve the increase in on-campus students as compared to the prior year period when we furloughed many employees in response to our COVID-related temporary store closures. At the end of the quarter, our cash balance was $11 million with outstanding borrowings of $183.3 million as compared to borrowings of $99.5 million in the prior year period. This increase is mostly due to the timing of receivables associated with the significant growth of our first day offerings. Schools generally remit payment for students enrolled in the courses after their student drop ad dates. Our current liquidity position remains strong. CapEx for the quarter was $9.9 million, essentially in line with the prior year period. Currently, our retail segment operates 1,445 college, university, and K-12 school bookstores, comprised of 794 physical bookstores and their e-commerce sites as well as 651 virtual bookstores. With that, we will open the call for questions. Operator, please provide instructions for those interested in asking a question. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure your device is unmuted locally. The first question comes from Alex Furman at Craig Hallam Capital Group. Alex, your line is open. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, you know, wanted to ask about the first day complete offering. Uh, looks like it added a, a you know a good amount of revenue for the quarter. Can you, can you talk about how it performed operationally, given everything going on with the supply chain, and and in terms of profitability and and how it contributed to the overall EBITDA for the quarter? Would you say that it met your expectations here in in the first? you know, big semester with, with a critical mass of students? Yeah, Alex, thanks for your question. It's, uh, I think, probably the primary one that we've been focusing on, and we're still, uh, given that rush and the fall semester are, are still underway, we're still analyzing some of it, given how the cash flows are on first day complete. But we're very, very happy with the performance, especially the operational execution of first day complete. I'll let John Shar talk about it a little bit more, but from our perspective, it went very, very well. Some of that was aided by the fact that a large percentage of the courseware that was being sold in some of the big first day complete implementations that we did this year for the first time were, were digital courseware, which you know made it somewhat easier to fulfill in the large schools that elected the first day complete versus you know those with a larger mix of physical books. But the execution went very well. Uh, in terms of the financial impact, uh, you know, there's there's several variables that affect first day complete contribution to uh, to the financials and the and the and the economic kind of formula, enrollments, conversion of the enrollments, and and then just the unit pricing for the semester hours. If you're looking at, you know, how do you build the model and then how does it, how does the result you know, to answer your question around expectations, I think that, you know, our expectations depends on what time of year you're talking about. I think when we built our budget for fiscal year 23 or 22, rather, sorry, back, you know, in the spring, uh, we didn't have the knowledge of, of the enrollment declines, especially in the community colleges that, you know, that happened. I think the conversion you know, was very, very close, very close to where we expected it to be. And, and then average pricing, uh, you know, was uh, it, it varies by school, probably somewhat somewhat lower, just because the number of, of credit hours. Uh, there are a number of full full time students, but there are also a lot of part time students, given the environment we're in right now. So the number of credit hours is probably a little bit lower than we thought it would be. But overall, very very pleased with the performance of first day complete and first day. Um, and I'll let John talk about it a little bit further. 
Yeah, thanks, Mike. And, uh, and just building uh, on that, um, you know, the team um, did an incredible job of executing first day completed scale across the 65 campus stores where it was implemented in fall term. Uh, we really had, um, uh, you know, complete coverage of the book lists for those schools. Uh, we were aided by the transition to digital um, and, uh, and the availability of digital content uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, helped with the execution. But I would say from an execution standpoint at scale, it was outstanding and really sort of um, gives us a lot of confidence in the ability to continue to uh, scale the program. Uh, and in terms of sort of expectations, uh, in terms of uh, the, the model and the benefit of the program, I, I think that it was very much in line with our expectations. Uh, and the, the nice thing about the, the program is that it's really done on an individual campus by campus basis, lo local basis. So the cost and the pricing on a per credit hour basis is really individual for each campus based on their weighted average of enrollment against courses and the specific book list against those courses. So we did see prices come down, but that's because the cost of the content came down as well. Uh, and, uh, and also our school's desire to bring down uh, the cost of content, which help us from an operating cost standpoint. So. I think the model was really great. We've added, as we said uh, in the script, 10 additional campus stores and, and approximately 86,000 in undergrad uh, enrollment for spring, which you know is not really a term where you'd expect to add a lot of, um, of campus stores and enrollment to the program based on the fact that the majority of campuses and, and institutions would make that decision on an academic year basis when tuition and fees are set for that year in advance in sort of the first quarter time frame of uh, calendar first quarter time frame. So incredibly excited about the, the prospects of first day complete and, uh, and what will mean for our campus partners, student outcomes, uh, and our business. Great. That's really helpful. Let me, add, let me add one. Let me add, add, add one comment. Let me add one comment, Alex. Too is that you know this is a we're just scaling this. This is our first first semester where we really got significant scale on first day complete. And there's a lot of things that we learned in scaling in terms of how different schools are marketing this program, what works, what didn't work as well, which resulted in in some cases lower what I would call conversion or you know, lower, uh, higher opt-out perhaps than, than we would see in, in many other cases. We have some schools that are 100 percent, you know, we have some that are, are lower getting us to an average that's kind of, you know, below 100 percent. But, you know, we've learned a lot, and I think that will only improve, you know, the conversion and results going forward and starting in the spring. Great. That, that's uh, that's really helpful. And I, I, I did want to follow up on the the ten additional schools that are signed up for the spring semester. You know that that was certainly unexpected, given that you know schools don't typically tend to shake things up like that in, in the middle of the the academic year. Um, can can you talk a little bit about the the sales pipeline? I mean, it, you know, it would would have to think it's pretty strong, given that you have ten schools um, joining joining the program mid year. Is it, is it too early to get a sense of uh, how many strong leads you have heading into the, the fall semester next year? Yeah, I'll give Jonathan, give guidance, um, specific guidance. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah, we're optimistic. I mean, I think the 10, um, as you said, the 10 stores and, and 86,000 of additional enrollment are, are a really good sign. And I think why we're so optimistic is the impact the program is having on student outcomes and having students prepared and the, and the benefits of retention and persistence that our institutions are showing. And, and as Mike said in the script, you know, certain institutions are also showing that uh, enrollment growth because of their ability to market this program. So based on that, uh, the pipeline is really uh, robust and really excited about the prospects uh, of that based on the data that's coming from the institutions that have uh, executed the program with us. 
Great. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Ryan McDonald at Needham. Ryan, your line is open. Yeah, good morning, Mike and Tom, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, congrats on a nice quarter here. Um, you know, great to see the progress you're making on the Fanatics and Lids relationship in terms of, you know, additional sites that you've been adding. Just curious, as, as you've been, you know, those sites have been going live, you know, what sort of, sort of uplift you're seeing uh, to general merchandise sales, you know, from that perspective and, and, and sort of how you're feeling about, you know, as we – uh, see these these additional sites rolling out about sort of the out, the opportunity you know here for general merchandise as we go into say the spring semester. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That's a that's a really important question. It's uh, you know for for purposes of the fall rush, as as I think we disclosed, we had you know about just under 15 schools that were really up and running on the what we call fanatic e-commerce system. Uh, as you know, we turned over the, the management of the, of the stores in terms of the emblematic and logo, logoed items to, to Lids and, and Fanatics under the FLC uh, uh, entity that we partner with back in, back in April. And they worked feverishly to get inventory into the stores um, all summer long as it became apparent that there was going to be a snapback in demand. Um, those 15 stores where we had e-commerce results <clears throat> increased substantially. You know, you're trying to compare it to 20 and you're trying to compare it to 19. When we compare it to 20, 20 was a big year for e-commerce because of the fact that there were no, very, very few campuses open, uh, very few stores open, you know, uh, so the e-commerce activity was much higher in 20. So we compare it to both 20 and 19 and comparing it to both years without getting into the specific uh, percentages uh, there's substantial substantial improvement. It's important to note that the 540 sites that we talk about that are now part of the, you know, subject to the fanatics experience, which means that a student comes into our e-commerce system, and if they select from the menu they want apparel, logoed, emblematic items, they're seamlessly transferred into the fanatic system, which is being customized you know, to reflect each student's brand, each school's brand, sorry, the brand of each school, a more local, more personalized approach. And that's only happened for you know, over 500 of those schools within the last six weeks or so. So what we're really looking forward to is, and we've started to see already with Black Friday, we're looking at the results, which we'll report in our third quarter, and also Cyber Monday, which we haven't gathered the results from, we you know, haven't received the results yet from, from Fanatics, but we're very encouraged by the early results from what we saw for this, this vastly higher number of schools that are now on offering the Fanatics experience. And I would encourage you or anyone else that's interested to go look at the sites and, and see, see how, uh, how expansive they are in terms of assortment and how easy they are to use and how you know, how uh, representative they are, what I would call you know, really a uh, best-in-class e-commerce website. So we're excited about what's going to happen, not just in the spring semester, but over the holidays from an e-commerce perspective, now that we have so many schools up and running. Not just on e-commerce, but also yeah, the stores, but particularly in commerce. Yeah, it's a really good point on the e-commerce side um, um, when you think about the holiday season and the potential that opens up here. Um, as my second question, I really wanted to ask about uh, Bartleby. It's it's great to see that the continued strength in the growth rate there and, and that the, the growth subs numbers continues to climb. You know, just curious to see what you're, what you're seeing in terms of student usage and adoption there um, as we've progressed through the semester because obviously, you know, as we saw, you know, uh, Check put up some some uh, weak numbers and, and it talked about maybe some changing uh, student usage patterns there. You know, just trying to understand, you know, if that's something that's more uh, industry wide or 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 you know how Barnes and Noble's uh, performance comparatively uh, looks for Bartleby. Thanks. Yeah, I think David Nenke can address that for us. Yeah, we um, we've seen students come back, and as um, we said in the introduction. Um, the students are learning through a, a mix of um, on-campus as well as uh, as well as virtual. Um, we are 
um, providing a service to customers to help augment their learning. Um, so we, um, I guess, are, are agnostic to their learning method. We want to be there to support students as they learn. We have continued to see good usage. Um, our customers are continuing to use us, and in fact, um, we saw mo uh, most of our metrics for our paid subscribers actually increase year on year in regards to time on site and usage, etc. So we're encouraged that we're building um, the services that can help support customers as they um, as they go through their learning, and so we're excited about what we're seeing. I wouldn't speculate on um, more broadly industry dynamics or anything like that. All we're trying to do is focus on providing the best service we can to our to our customers. So we're seeing good usage, and we're excited about how customers are, are responding to our products. Excellent. Thanks for taking my questions. The next question comes from Rory Wallace at Outerbridge Capital. Rory, your line is open. Thanks for taking my question. I, I was curious on first day complete, with the new signings, which, which seem like a quite high average enrollment for the spring term, is this a situation where the first day revenues could actually grow sequentially in the January quarter? And just following on some of the comments that Mike made around optimizing the marketing strategy behind the programs, is this something where the schools are uh, being receptive to kind of this co-marketing feedback in terms of how to, how to optimize the program structure to really drive enrollment or conversion? Yeah, Murray, this is Mike, and I'll let John jump in. But on your question around marketing, uh, co-marketing, you know, each, like John said, each school is different and they approach the marketing differently. Some are more cautious than others. Some are very aggressive. Some have, you know, marketed first day complete as books are free. And as John said, in those cases, some of those schools have actually increased enrollments and have gotten the attention of their, what we would call competitor schools, you know, in their geo areas who are now calling us saying, hey, this works for them. We need to see this. You know, some of it, some of those schools that are cautious, you know, are cautious because, you know, during the sales process, there's a lot of people in the schools that are involved in, in uh, making the decision to go to a first day complete inclusive access model. And so I think some of the schools are perhaps overly cautious in terms of how they market and how they might highlight the ability to opt out and that type of thing. Um, sometimes, you know, probably more so than the benefits uh, that's happened in a few cases. And uh, I think our conversations with the school when we were in the process of, of selling the, you know, the first day complete product, it's, it's clear that they see the benefits of it. And I now, I think now that they understand, you know, those benefits aren't going to be fully realized until, you know, and unless they, you know, they, they are more, um, I wouldn't call it aggressive in their marketing, they're just more kind of positive in their marketing as opposed to cautious and, uh, basically trying to, you know, to, to send the signals that more cover themselves from some of the constituents and the faculty and others that have, you know, have had some issues during the sales process. So I think the answer is yes, there, um, these learnings that I refer to, that's, that's basically one of the things I was referring to, the learnings around the marketing. And I think the schools that, that we have that experience with have come around, but I'll let, I'll let John talk about it more specifically if he wants to. Yeah, no, and I think that um, I, I think that uh, just building on that, uh, that based on the outstanding execution from our store teams and supporting the institutions that move to first day complete, there is a lot of confidence in our ability to execute at a high level <clears throat> and drive you know, student outcomes and and convenience and really create a concierge experience for students uh, and, and really sort of um, disrupt the course of material delivery model at those schools. And there's been a lot of great discussions on how to collaborate and optimize uh, the marketing and positioning of the program within institutions. So uh, we think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, within the schools that we've executed, 
to improve uh, the percent of students that are participating in the program and, and driving, uh, you know, driving our uh, sell-throughs even higher at those institutions, as well as, you know, the students as they've experienced this for the first time. You know, many of the schools um, were the first, this was the first semester that they were participating in the program. And as students see what the benefits uh, and having sort of a box of books ready for them prior to the first day of class, picking that up, I think there's more and more acceptance and understanding of the benefits of that, of having materials, doing uh, better in class, being better prepared, and our survey results show that as well. So I think it's both the schools um, becoming very uh, willing to collaborate in marketing and students becoming more excited that over time, we're going to see even enhanced participation and growth within the schools, and that also will lead to uh, more schools participating as they see the benefits of competitive or peer institutions. And Rory, on your question on incremental January revenue growth, we're not obviously giving any specific guidance on what's going to happen, but it just yeah, it would be logical to assume that that's going to happen with the number of of student enrollments being added under the first day complete program. I, I appreciate that. And I guess following on the on the question around the fall 23 pipeline, do you, do you have enough sort of sales and operational capacity to try to target similar, even higher levels of enrollment growth for first day complete in fall of 23? I, I understand there's just a lot of moving parts with the environment right now. The answer to that is definitely yes, we do, and yes, we are. I mean, we are. Uh, we do have a pipeline. We do have, you know, a uh, very, very detailed uh, sales process that we won't get into describing, but it's uh, it's got a very robust pipeline for for fall of 23. And some some of the things you see happening, some of the schools you see adopting first day complete in the spring semester of this year. Are, are some schools that are pulling forward, but most of those are, you know, most of those schools that we have on our site, so to speak, are having discussions with or have commitments from, in, in many cases, for fall of 23, you know, are, are schools that some wanted to do it earlier, but they just can't get to the point where they felt comfortable making that change that quickly, given the fact that they've already published, you know, rates and tuition rates and, and, and that type of thing. Uh, for fiscal year, our fiscal year 22 for spring semester. Great, thanks, Mike. And, and Tom, just a couple for you in terms of the one on cash flow from first day complete. I know it's you're, you're creating more receivables and kind of there's a cadence to collections now. I mean, do you think that those are those going to be kind of worked down by um, the end of this fiscal, or you know, is this kind of a structurally higher level of? of receivables and DSOs that you're going to be running with. And maybe just comment briefly on, on that. And then um, my last question was just on incremental margin performance. Obviously, you know, it's a tough supply environment, but at the same time, you seem to be getting a good benefit from your higher margin initiatives. So just curious how you're, you're feeling about sort of margin performance in, in the next few quarters. Yeah, thanks, Rory. <clears throat> uh, in terms of the working capital cycle, Historically, our working capital cycle was get the product in, sell it to the students, get the cash, and then pay the vendors. Um, to your point, and it's a good point, with the first day and first day complete products and, and the cadence on the campus, we're typically providing the products in a lot of instances paying for those products before we get paid by the school. So you're right, the receivables are higher, and, um, you know, this chalks up to perhaps, you know, lessons learned. Um, and we'll look to address that, and we're collecting it as we as we get through the semester. Uh, but really, the billing, the, the the real important date in the first day and first day complete products is that census date, and and that's really what triggers the uh, you know billing and reconciliation with the school student by student. So um, you will see that in your seat in the balance sheet, the receivables are higher, which is reflective of the growth of those programs, which is um, which is great that they're growing so quickly. Um, and you would expect as we get through the spring term that a lot of that would, would wash out by the fiscal year end. So, yes, um, you know, that, that, that should happen. 
in, in terms of the margin performance, I think it really comes down to, you know, what, what was missing last year were, were students on campus and what we're experiencing, and, and it's certainly not back to the pre-pandemic levels, is the mix. You know, when the kids come into the store and, and they pick up their materials or they're buying their course materials, they're also getting other supply products and, you know, cafe and convenience products as well as emblematic and logos. So having the full experience on campus will drive that sales mix, which should improve the margin performance over time. It's certainly not back to pre-pandemic levels, uh, but it's certainly moving in the right direction. And I would make one other comment. This is Mike Rory. That in the general merchandise area, you know, given the supply chain issues, we did sell through some of the older inventory that was transferred to uh, Fanatic Lids back in April uh, while we were waiting supply of some of the newer inventory. That inventory under our agreement with Fanatic Lids, uh, because of the sale contract that we struck with them, has a lower. Um, payment back to us, commission, I guess you would call it, than, than uh, you know, the current newer inventory that we're now moving into. So that did affect our margin somewhat, although the percentage of that that's remaining is, is now very, very low, so we should not see that dragging impact going forward. Okay, yeah, I, pre I appreciate that uh, distinction. And I guess just one, one more on um, Kind of it for, for David, just in terms of you know, understand please with the engagement at Bartleby, which seems to be bucking the trend somewhat versus some peers. What what are sort of the top growth initiatives for the business um, for the Bartleby and DSS business looking into the back half of this fiscal year, um, and and just how you can kind of structurally improve the positioning here um, with with the environment rapidly in flux, of course. Yeah, the, the main thing um, that we um, will focus on over the rest of the year, uh, we're going to you know, continue to work on the, the product and features, et cetera, but I think Bartleby Plus is the, uh, one of the main um, priorities. What we saw from our limited launch in-store um, to 55 stores, um, obviously we'll aim to, to roll that out to the rest of the uh, stores are as, as many as possible, also available online and SEO. We've seen good take up and good usage from um, our customers on that product. We're very excited about um, the full range of features being available to customers, etc. So, you know, that will be uh, one of our key priorities going forward as we as we kind of look at uh, providing a full suite of services to customers and how they use it and how they engage with our product. So, um, for the back half of the the year, we'll you know, continue to work on features and, and some of those things, but part of the plus is going to be one of the, the key initiatives for us and really getting that in the hands of, of students so they can use the full range of, of the product. So that was, I think, uh, um, one of the things that we were excited about going into and um, it exceeded uh, our expectations for, um, for the full rush period. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you taking all my questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rory. Another reminder to press star one if you have any more questions to ask. don't appear to be having any more questions coming through, so I'll hand the call back to Andy for any closing remarks. Great. Thanks, Bethany. And thank you all for joining us on today's call and your continued interest in B&ED. Please note, our next scheduled financial release will be our fiscal 22 third quarter earnings in early March. We hope everybody has a great holiday season. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect your lines.